Welcome to Ingemar Baptist Church. I'm Ronnie Rains. We're so glad to have you join us in worship. Here are a few things happening on the hill. Evangelism Boot Camp will be meeting in the Family Life Center immediately after this morning service. The church office has moved into the new office suite located behind the youth sanctuary. Work is still in progress in some areas, but go take a look at the renovations. A pastor search committee will be voted on September the 8th. Further details of this committee will be located in your bulletin and upcoming newsletter. Operation Christmas Child donations are this month are crayons, pens, markers, small notebooks, and refillable plastic water bottles. Sign-up sheets for the directory photos are located on the welcome desk in the south foyer. Be sure to pick up a registration form, which will be next to the sign-up sheets. Fill it out. Bring it with you to your session. Please see Hayden or Kim Edwards with any questions and Miss Betty Short for scheduling needs. Our annual church-wide committee meeting will be held on August 25th at 5 p.m. for everyone serving in a committee. Revival is still scheduled for September 22nd through the 25th. Abide Women's Conference is set for January 31st through February the 1st, 2025 at New Orleans Seminary. All women are invited to go. A $50 deposit is due on August 28th. Please reach out to the Courtney Norris if you're interested. Finally, if you're visiting with us, please take a second to scan the QR code or fill out a guest card and stop by the welcome desk on your way out to pick up a free gift. That's what's happening on the Hill. Thanks for being here to worship with us. Am I turned on? No. Am I on? Work this thing. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, good to see everybody. How are y'all doing? Good. It is so good to see all of you. I hope you've had a great week, and uh, I'm glad to see all of your faces here this morning to come and worship t- today as we gather corporately and worship as a church family. Listen, guys, I'm grateful to see what God's going to do and to be a part of it here this morning, and I'm just, here we go, ready? I'm excited. <laughs> Got to get it in while I can, right, Stephen? I'm excited to see what God is going to do uh, through us and in us here today this morning. Listen, I'm going to open this in a word of prayer, and then we will get started. So would you pray with me? Father, we come and we thank you so much, Father, for this great opportunity that we have to come and gather corporately, Lord God, and worship you in this place. Now, Father, I simply pray that this morning you would put all of the distractions, all the noise, all of the Uh, Lord, the things that are drawing our attention away from you, I pray that we would put all those things away, that you'd help us to remove those things from our minds and our hearts, that God, this morning, we would focus on you. Father, we are here for one purpose, and that is to worship you and to bring honor and praise to you. And so, God, this morning, I pray that that is simply what we would do. I pray that we would search our hearts, that you would search us and you'd show us, Father, where we, uh, Lord, need to... We need conviction and that you'd convict us in those areas and, Father, we would get ourselves right before you so that, Father, our worship to you would be pleasing in your sight. So, Father, this morning I simply ask you that you would fill this place, that you fill each heart and mind, that, Father God, you would show up in a mighty way. Lord God, I love you and I thank you. And I ask all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim with me the Lord's greatness and exalt his name forever.
Gospel of John. Let's do this. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Me, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. we come to you this morning. Lord, it's ask that you please be with us we continue on in our worship time this morning. Lord, be, please be with Brother Rob. Lord, just allow him to, to preach your word this morning that you've worked on him this week and allow us to be open and ready to receive it, to apply it to our lives so that we can go out and tell people more about you and we can be true lights for you throughout the week. Don't let this just be a time that we just check off a box this morning, but it's a time that we come in to praise and worship you and to learn more about you. God, I love you. God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy you give us day in and day out. In Jesus' name, amen.
copy of God's Word, open with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4. Last time I preached in Acts, I resigned, so <laughs> maybe we won't do that this morning, buddy. I don't know. <laughs> maybe there won't be any surprises. Acts chapter 4, that's where we're going to be this morning. If you're there in Acts chapter 4, say Amen. So I, I know, if you're like me, you're very, very forgetful on things at times. I know that I am. Sometimes I have a hard time remembering even what I preached last week. But when I came and preached a trial sermon here on October the 23rd of 2022, I preached on, will you take the job? That was the sermon that I preached. I love preaching that. It's my favorite thing to preach. But in that sermon. I don't know if you remember this, so maybe I sound like a broken record. In that sermon, I told a story about having squashed Mr. Wilbur at the vegetable farm coming out of our ears. I mean, it was just everywhere, right? We, we planted a, a ton of squash. So let me refresh your memory. At the vegetable farm, by the way, I was a vegetable farmer. At the vegetable farm, the first year we farmed commercially, we had black plastic you know, that's like this plastic film you put down on top of the rows and you plant through it. And uh, it heats the soil up earlier in the spring. And you can, there's drip tape that goes under it. So all the irrigation is right there in the bed. And my machine would lay down a band of fertilizer in the bed when you would plant it. So it was all one pass. It was all self-contained. All the irrigation was there. And so anyway, we had it in our head. We were going to plant some squash. And uh, I don't know if you guys ever have planted squash before. You've, some of you have seen your gardens. But, you know, one plant produces quite a bit of squash. Did you know that? Well, I didn't know, I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we decided we were going to plant like several thousand plants of squash. And uh, seriously, you know, I thought, well, you know, we'll get two or three squash off each one. and Yeah. So uh, anyway, and we were not a very big operation at this point. Like this is just a few little farmer's markets on the side. And so we planted several thousand squash plants at one time, might I say. You didn't stagger it, but we planted it all at one time. And I want to tell you that being in that black plastic early in the year before the bugs and the disease and everything got on them and the fertilizer was just right, I calculated it all out and the water was just right and temperature was just right, I'm talking about. We have squash everywhere. In fact, I was going through pictures last night, Jordan, deleting some stuff off my phone to free up some memory, and I saw a picture of a lot of that squash that we had piled up in our living room. I mean, like you couldn't even walk in. We didn't have a cooler at the time, so we had to get it out of the heat. So it was like one path. We were like, if we've been on that show, Hoarders, you know what I'm saying, except squash edition. Squash was everywhere. 
everywhere. And I think about how those squash plants thrived. But then we planted okra. Some of you are saying, Brother Rob, that's like the easiest thing to grow. Speak for yourself, okay? We planted some okra. And I planted the rows, laid the rows off in the wrong direction. So the water didn't drain like it should have. So we had standing water in our okra patch. You know, okra likes hot and dry weather, it seems like, right? They don't like wet feet. And they didn't do very well. Oh, yes, Marcy, they survived. They lived. They produced a few okra, okras. (laughs) But they didn't thrive like the squash plant. Josh Davis and I, we hate to call you out, not really, but we had a, (laughs) we had a, uh, Conversation about the difference between thriving and surviving, didn't we? You see, there is a big difference between being the squash plant that is thriving, that is producing tenfold, that is going all over the place. There's a difference between the squash plant and the okra plant that's just surviving. Brother Rob, where in the world? Are you going with all? I thought you told me to turn to Acts, not the vegetable handbook. Here's where I'm going with this. As Ingemar Baptist Church pushes on into the future, my prayer is that you would not simply survive. Oh, you can do that. You've got enough money in the bank account. You can keep the lights on. But my prayer for Ingemar Baptist Church is that as you push forward into the future, you would not just simply survive, but you would indeed thrive. You wouldn't be like the okra plant standing in water. Oh, yeah, you produce a few pieces of okra. But you'd be like the squash plant, thriving. People would say, that place is bursting at the seams. Look at what God is doing there at that place. You know, it's really weird, Kyle. I, I'm a, it's a strange predicament. I've got this Sunday and two more Sundays left, right? Is that right? My math is correct. My math is correct. What do I preach in these next coming Sundays? Can't do a series, <laughs> right? What do I preach? Well, this morning, I'll tell you what I'm preaching. I'm charging this congregation... That as you move forward without me, you would be a church who thrives. You would be an individual. How does the church thrive? We'll talk about more of that in a moment. But you would be an individual who not only just survives, gets through life, but you would thrive in Christ Jesus. So will you be a church who thrives? Will you be the squash plant kind of church? Or will you be... The okra plant. You know, I I think we have a picture, Jordan, here in Scripture of a very, very young church. A church plant. You know, maybe they were hipsters, buddy. I don't know, skinny jeans and frosted tip hair. I don't know, but (laughs) probably not, okay? But we still have a church plant, a young church. And I think that we have, I think that we have a description and an account of a church that is not just surviving, but it is indeed thriving. Look with me. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. I want to read. (laughs) I want to read two verses. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. I knew all the pages were going to go when I said 32. (laughs) Watch this. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. I think we have an account here in Scripture of a church that is not simply surviving, but is indeed thriving. Think about this. We are in Acts chapter 
4. How does the book of Acts begin? It begins with what? The ascension of Jesus Christ, right? Acts 1.8, right? And you'll be my witness. Remember that? And Jesus ascends, and now the book of Acts, uh, I believe the author to be Luke, the same Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke, he is giving us an account of the things, the events that transpired as the Gospel spread from Jerusalem, from that day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes on the believers there, they're filled with the Spirit, and then the gospel, leaving from that point, spreads to the uttermost parts of the earth. In fact, we get to the end of the book, and Paul is towards the end of his ministry, and he's in Rome, he's on house arrest. And so, from Acts, the book of Acts, we have this account, we have this scripture, story, this narrative of the gospel being spread, the church being started. The church begins at Pentecost, the, the church age, and we have it, a picture of it spreading. And in theory, Josh, in theory, if Luke had have lived for like another 2,000 years and he just kept writing stuff down, right, what happened in the church, we would be a part of this narrative today, Right? I don't know what chapter that would be, a big one, a big number. But we're part of the narrative. So here we are in Acts chapter 4, and we're going all the way back towards the beginning of this narrative when the church is just getting started. People are just now being one to Christ in multitudes. I mean, you say, well, that's been going on for a couple of years. So what? That, in the grand scheme of things, that's the beginning of the church. It's a young church. And here in chapter 4, we have a description of this church that despite the persecution, despite the hardships, despite the things that are going on in the world in regard to this church, in its context, this church is thriving. And I think that there are three descriptors here that I want to point out of this thriving church. So if you're taking notes, write this down. When the church thrives, dot, 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 dot. Okay, write that down. When the church thrives, number one, when the church thrives, there is unity. Say unity. Let's try it again. All in unity. Say unity. Unity. There is unity in the body of Christ amongst the believers. Look at verse 32. Watch. And the congregation of those who believed were of what? One heart and soul. The congregation here, these, this body of believers, they are unified. Think about it. They are from all different walks of life. All different backgrounds. Think about just the disciples, the original apostles, the twelve. The 12. Think about those original disciples, right? I mean, you had one guy who was a tax collector. He was a scourge of the earth. You had some fishermen, smelly, stinking fishermen. Then you had a zealot who was a radical guy, right? And you, you had a, a group of people who were from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life, never would have associated with one another. But yet here in Acts chapter 4, we see a group of people who are unified under one name. And his name is Jesus Christ. You see, the church, because they are unified under Christ, are unified amongst the brethren. I think when a church is thriving, there will indeed be unity in the church. You know, um, we have an evangelism boot camp meeting after this, by the way. So there's the plug, Stoney, (laughs) after the service. But you know, one of the great joys, one of the great joys of my ministry here at Ingemar has been leading that evangelism boot camp teams. You know, there was only a few of us that signed up and went, and uh, that's okay. I'll just say this. If you didn't go, you missed out. I think we're going to, it's going to continue, and I pray that it does. Sign up for it. Go to it next year to the mission trips when it starts all over again. But I want to tell you, one of the greatest joys in my ministry here has been being a part of that evangelism boot camp group. You know, I don't know, Kim, I think you and Hayden were there. 
you there all the time, but <laughs> do you remember, were y'all there at Tupelo? We went to Tupelo to the Tupelo Mall. I think we led like, what, how many, Brian, like eight people, six people, something like that to the Lord there at Tupelo. And so we went into the mall, surprised we didn't get kicked out. We went to the mall and we went around and we shared the gospel and Everybody's on fire, Amber. I mean, on fire, right? People getting saved, and this is early on, and people are like, holy smokes, it actually works. When you share the gospel, people get saved. You know, wow, just, just great joy amongst that group. And so we get done, and everybody's, you know, we've, we've, all, we've all been out working for the kingdom of God, and uh, we go to the food court. You remember this? We go to the food court at the end. And we're sitting here at this long table. Everybody is happy, joyful, unified, loving one another. The Spirit of God is amongst us and we've, He's moved in such a mighty way that people have passed from eternal death into eternal life and there's just this great joy. But there seemed to be such unity amongst the 15 people that went. Sitting there at that table. And I remember sitting there and looking. And you're saying, this is so nostalgic, Brother Rob. That's okay, I don't care. I remember sitting there looking at this group of people who were unified under one name for one purpose, for one mission, joyfully serving the Lord and thinking, that, that is the church. That is what the church should look like. Not buildings, not programs, not uh, the evangelism boot camp team, but that unity amongst the brethren serving Jesus Christ, that is what the church should look like. Guys, my prayer for Ingemar Baptist Church is that as you go forward without me, listen, I'm just a man, okay? If you put your faith in me, you put it in the wrong person. As you go forward, my prayer is that you would be unified. This group of people would love one another and be united under one name, driven by one mission and purpose. And if you were to do that, Ingemar, you know what would happen? The church would thrive. The church would thrive. Listen, I believe that when the church thrives, there is unity. I also believe that the scriptures teach that when the church thrives, there is, number two, if you take a note, selflessness. Everybody say selflessness. Not selfishness, selflessness. <laughs> Look at verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were one heart and soul. Not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. You know, so many people have taken this out of Scripture throughout history to try to justify communism. That's not true. No one is forcing these believers to give all of their stuff away. These believers are so sold out for Christ Jesus. They are so on fire for the Lord. They are so wound up. They are such, they are such a unified body. They are such a family that the property that they own became common property amongst the believers. They put their self-advancement to the side and they became selfless for one another in Christ Jesus. I think that this passage teaches that when the church thrives, there is indeed selflessness. These people, think about it. They're normal people. We have this idea that like the people who lived at this time, they were a little bit dumber than us. They, uh, they like, lived in a cave or, and they had like, you know, a, like a, a, a pot a, like for a bowl and like a wooden spoon. You know, maybe they had a donkey or a goat or cart maybe. And that's all that they had, right? And, and so, yeah, it's not that big a deal to give up all of their stuff. 
They didn't really have preferences back then. They were just trying to survive. <laughs> there was no such thing as comfort back then, right? No that, no, that is so wrong. These people were normal people, just like you and I. They just live in a different time. They had homes and possessions and family and comfort and preferences and all of these things that required us that, that a society has today that same society at that time had so it's easy to say yeah it was easy for them to give it all up no it was just like it is for you to give it up but yet here we have this church this group of people who are selflessly devoted to one another and the lord so much so that they are giving everything away wow how crazy is that you know i wrote in my bible (laughs) i wrote in my bible and i don't you know i don't like to write in my bible i feel like uh, i don't know maybe i I have a problem i guess but i did hear and as i was preparing for this i saw what i had written through some of my quiet time and i guess it stuck out to me during that time so much so that i was willing to defile my bible (laughs) by writing writing in it (laughs) and i wrote out beside verse 32 How different we are as Baptists today. How different we are. I mean, even even proper, let's let's just be honest for a moment. I'm out of here anyway, so let's just be honest for a moment. Even things that are supposed to be church property and common property aren't really common property, are they? Are they? We have different things that we love. We have different uh, areas of the church that we take ownership in. Wrongfully, we take ownership in. First of all, it's not, it's not Brother Rob's church. It's not your church. It's Jesus Christ's church, right? But there are things that we take ownership in, and we should not take ownership in them. Right? Because they're common. We take ownership in a Sunday school room. We take for ownership in a piece of furniture. We take ownership in a program. We take ownership in things that we think are ours and rightfully they belong to Jesus. They're the churches. How much different do we look when we squabble and squall over things that are already belong to the church? How much different does that look compared to what we see in Scripture. That the things that are rightfully theirs, they're giving it away. You go forward into Ananias and Sapphira, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. You remember those people, right? They sold some piece of land or something, and they brought the money, and they held half of it back, and they lied about it, and guess what happened? Peter said, why is it this day you've lied to the Holy Spirit? Boom, he drops dead. Sapphira comes in and says, did you sell this piece of property? Peter said, did you sell this piece of property, Right? Peter says, was it not rightfully yours to do with what you pleased before you gave it? (laughs) And he said, because of this, the same men who carried your husband out are going to carry you out. Boom. Struck dead. We have a picture, guys, here in Acts. Where are you going with that? It was theirs to do with what they pleased. But because the entirety of the church was selling their stuff and bringing it to the church and giving it to people who had need, they felt obligated to do that. But look at the picture. Don't focus on Ananias and Sapphira. Look at what was going on in that time. The selflessness of the church. How much different are we? So I have uh, four kids now. I have four kids now. That sounds weird. I have a son. That sounds really weird. This is my son. (laughs) I don't know if I'm well pleased yet. (laughs) That was a Bible joke. Read your Bible if you don't understand it, okay? (laughs) But you know, my third child, Lauren, okay? She is so sweet. She's so sweet. She'll punch you in the mouth, but she's sweet, okay? (laughs) She loves binkies. Like, she just loves her binky. Like, we've been trying to break her of this binky. She just loves that binky. You know what I'm saying? She walks around, binky, binky, where are you? You know, I'm looking for a binky, okay? (laughs) She loves her binky. And 
she goes to the daycare here, and so, you know, daycare, kids get sick and kind of snotty and all that stuff, so the binky gets kind of crusty, you know what I'm saying? Like, it drips down onto the binky, and there's like a wad of stuff there that has accumulated, okay? Every once in a while, I get the pressure washer, pressure wash it off, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the binky, okay? She loves that binky. She does not part with that binky, Okay? Like I said, she'll punch you in the mouth. Take that binky, all right? I'm telling you. So baby brother, okay, Eli, my son, that sounds weird. Our, my son, Eli, was crying. Remember this, Jordan, the other day? This is right when he was born, was crying. He's upset, you know, he's fussing. And here comes little Lauren, two years old. Takes that crusty binky out. <laughs> and tries to hand it. And get it, give it to Eli. Now, our mom and dad were like, whoa, 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 hold on now, you know. <laughs> but she did. Popped the binky out. And she tried to give it to Eli. She loves that binky. And I thought to myself, how selfless. That a two-year-old whose most important possession is that binky. When her brother was in need, she popped it out and selflessly gave it. What would happen if the church, what would happen if the church was like that? That when we saw people in need, we saw people hurting, we saw our brother and sister in Christ struggling, we selflessly gave what we could. I'll tell you what would happen. You know what would happen? The church would thrive. The church would thrive. You see, Josh, because I believe that when the church thrives, number one, there's unity. And then, number two, there is selflessness. And then, number three, oh, I've been waiting for this one, Stephen. For those taking notes, number three, when the church thrives not only is there unity and selflessness but there is power turn to your neighbor and say there is power when the church thrives josh when the church thrives i'm telling you there is power watch this verse 32 let's back up it's in verse 33, but let's read 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Watch this. Here we go. And with great what? Power. The apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. You know what happened? You know what was going on, Jeff, in the church? The apostles were preaching. As the old country preachers say, they were shucking the corn, right? <laughs> they were shelling the corn on down, or whatever that phrase is. The apostles were testifying of Jesus Christ. You know what they were doing? They were preaching the gospel. But they weren't just getting up behind the pulpit if they had that during that day. They weren't just getting up, and they weren't giving some theological treatise. They weren't just giving some uh, uh, some funny speech they weren't telling a bunch of jokes no they were preaching the gospel and they were preaching it with what with power do you think let's just take a moment here for a second do you think that it was because the apostles were just powerful preachers do you think that the reason there was power when the apostles preached and when the gospel was proclaimed do you think that it was because of their homiletical ability no do you think that they were like like peter was just the wordsmith that adrian rogers was no maybe but do you think that's why peter had power when he stood up and preached no no you see rick i believe that the reason there was power in that preaching is because God had placed his hand on those men. He filled them with the Spirit. He anointed them. And throughout that place that they were meeting and proclaiming the gospel, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God Almighty was with them, empowering 
that proclamation of the gospel. You see, I believe that there was power. Why? Not because of the ability of the apostles, but because God showed up. You ever been a part of a service? You ever been somewhere when God just shows up? You ever been there? I think about one. And let me get under a soapbox. Let me get in the floor out of humility. This has nothing to do with Brother Rob's preaching, okay? It has everything to do with God. Do you remember the Psalm 100 sermon? The service where we flipped the sermon. And the, who was here for that? You remember we preached first and then uh, we sang at the end of that service. You remember that? Yeah. We should have had those AEDs, Dylan, wherever you're at. <laughs> People say, oh, we ain't never done that before. <laughs> but you know, I think God just showed up that Sunday. I don't know. I can't explain it. I think, Ellen, wasn't that the Sunday you got saved? I think that was the Sunday you got saved. I mean, it was just the Lord just showed up. People in the floor crying and weeping. And it was a basic sermon. Let me tell you, I wrote that. That was a sermon that I wrote in preaching class, okay? So it was, a, it was a basic sermon. It wasn't some homiletic masterpiece. But it was just that God showed up. There was power in this place. People being convicted and getting themselves right with the Lord. And it's all because of God. Let me ask you a question. I know God is everywhere all the time, okay? I understand that. He is omnipresent. That is a truth. But there are some times that he shows up and he manifests himself in a powerful way. You would understand that. You agree with that. So when I say that God showed up, you understand I'm speaking of that second time when he shows up in a powerful way, right? What if every time we gathered as a body of believers, God showed up like that? What do you think would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. There would not be a revival. There would be an awakening. This globe would transform. People would be saved. Yeah, there'd be an outside word. Still, I'm not talking about evangelizing the whole the whole world, but I'll tell you, the church wouldn't sleep in the pews every Sunday. I'll tell you, people would be on fire. The gospel would advance. We would see something like we've never seen in our lifetime happen. If God would show up. You know what would happen? You know what would happen, buddy? If God would show up on Sunday mornings, the church would thrive. It wouldn't just survive but it would thrive. You know, I heard Steve Gaines preach. He'll be here in a couple of weeks, and I pray that every one of you guys are back to hear him on Sunday night. Pastor of Bellevue Baptist, I heard him preach at a pastor's conference or something, and he said, your job, pastor, is not to get people to show up to church. Your job is to get God to show up to church. Well, you know what? I'm going to say the same thing to you, church. Your job is not to get people to show up to church. Your job is not to have the most spectacular sermon, to have the most spectacular service, to have the most spectacular ornate sanctuary. Your job is not to make sure you have the biggest sign. While all of those things are fantastic, that is not your primary job. Your job, church and congregation, fellow believer and fellow Christian, your job is to get God to show up. When you come and gather, you bring the Lord with you. How do you do that, Brother Rob? You get sold out for Jesus. That's how you do it. You get sold out for Jesus. You make Him your heart's desire. 
You live your life every day. You quit playing the cultural Christian thing and you quit putting on the smile and your suit and your tie and walking in the doors and walk out and live however you want to live Monday through Saturday and come back in and do it all over again. No, you live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. You love him with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. You love your neighbor as yourself and you get yourself sold out for Jesus Christ. And when you do the church, when this congregation does that, when this body of believers does that, you know what will happen? God will show up, and ultimately, what results from that is the church thrives. Because I believe, Mr. Paul, I believe the word, Mr. Paul, is the inner, infallible, inerrant, inspired word of God. And I believe this is what the word teaches here. Is that when a church is thriving, we have a description of when a church is thriving, there is unity, there is selflessness, and oh yes, there is power. So Ingemar Baptist Church, I simply say to you that as you move forward as a church, Oh, yes, you'll find another preacher, and I pray for him, and I pray he's ten times the preacher that I am and ten times the evangelist that I am. And if we're running 400, I pray you guys in a year are running 800. But as you press forward without me, listen, you don't need me. You know what happened? You know what they say in ministry? You know what they say, hey, in the ministry, if you die tomorrow, you know what the church will do? They eat chicken and form a committee, Okay. But as you eat chicken and form a committee, okay? Don't just survive. Don't just survive. But thrive. Be a church that thrives. How do you do that, Brother Rob? I told you, you get sold out for Jesus. It starts with you. With you. I can't do it for you. Josh Davis, you can't do it for you. Avery Norris, you can't do it. Miss Beverly, I love your organ playing, but your organ playing can't do it for him. No, you have to be sold out yourself. You have a personal relationship with Jesus, and it starts with you. You want Ingemar to thrive? You start thriving. You want to thrive? Get sold out for Jesus. Give him everything. Not just your money or your tithe or any of that physical stuff, but you, yourself, your time, your being, your love, your desire. Give it to him. Sell yourself out to him. And you watch how you thrive. And you watch how the church thrives. Oh, it may not be easy. It may not be great. <laughs> Physically or monetarily or whatever, but you watch spiritually, you'll take off like a rocket. So I'm going to ask you, are you thriving or are you surviving? The truth is here is that many of us are just surviving. You say, Brother Rod, that's all I feel like I can do. Life is hard. <laughs> I know it's hard. Trust me. Don't be the one just surviving. Thrive. Submit yourself to your Lord. Be intentional about the spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and the study of God's Word, fellowshipping amongst the believers. Let your heart seek after Jesus Christ above all things. Don't just survive, but thrive. The truth is, is that statistically speaking, if I were a betting man, there's some here who are not surviving, but they're dying. They're dying. You know, the moment you were born, you start dying. Did you know that? You start dying. And I'm not talking about just a physical death. I'm talking about a spiritual death. You're a sinner. Every one of us are sinners. I'm a sinner. I'm the chief of sinners. There was a point in my life when I was dying. 
and I was on my way to hell, a spiritual death because of my sins, not because of what anybody else has done, but because of me. But you know what happened? Jesus saw me and he bought me. (laughs) And as the Bible says, guess what, Katie? I was born again. You see, I was born the first time dying, but I was born a second time. And now I'm living. Why? Because Jesus Christ has saved me and he's living within me. And there's some here today who are just like me who are dying spiritually. Oh, you might go to church. You might give a tithe. You might do all these things. But spiritually, you're dying. Let me tell you, if you're dying, don't die. How crazy does that sound? Don't die. Don't die, okay? Live. You can live forever and have eternal life through Christ Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you have never truly repented of your sins. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Forgive me, Jesus. I am trusting in you, Jesus, to save me. If you've not done that, if that's not your heart's posture towards Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, Do not leave without doing that. Please don't leave without being truly alive. In Gamar Baptist Church, I simply ask you this morning, are you surviving, maybe dying, or are you thriving? I'm going to ask you to stand. The instrumentalists are getting into place. Come and thrive. Be sold out for Jesus. Come and commit yourself to Him fresh and anew during this invitation time. The altar is open. I'm here to pray with you. Brother Avery will be here to pray with you. I just simply ask that you would come and thrive. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you. God, I pray that we would be a people who don't just survive, don't just get by, but we'd be a church, we'd be a people group who are thriving under one name, unified, selflessly, receiving power through the Spirit of God, Father God, under one name, and that name is Jesus Christ. So, Father, help us this morning to simply thrive. Lord, we love you and we thank you, and I ask this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here to worship with us online. If you'd like to make a decision today, call the number that's on your screen. We have counselors that are standing by that would love to help. If you're calling after our live services, leave us a message and some contact information and we'll get back with you. Thanks once again for being here to worship with us. I hope to see you soon in person and God bless.